live from the mist and shrouded mountaintop fortress that is X and Y Communications Headquarters. You're listening to the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. Hello once again, gentlemen, and welcome to another big show, another episode of the world-famous Mountaintop Podcast. My name is Scott McKay, at Scott McKay on Twitter, Real Scott McKay on Instagram, Scott McKay on YouTube, and you can find us on the web at www.mountaintoppodcast.com. And I also invite you, as always, to join us on the Facebook group and really do it this time because you guys are missing out on a lot if you're not already there with us talking about masculinity and women and stuff. And that's at Mountain Top Summit on Facebook. Today, we're going to tackle a topic that I'm really excited about because it's something a lot of guys hear about. It's something that perhaps we even think about, but it's often something that we don't ever get around to doing. And although I've thought about doing this particular show, perhaps ironically, I've never gotten around to doing it until right here, right now. A big part of that is because I finally found a fantastic guest to help me discuss it. His name is Jonathan Catherman, and he and his wife, Erica, have actually written a series of books that are all wildly popular. And the one that I think has probably sold the most and the one that caught my attention in particular is called The Manual to Manhood, How to Cook the Perfect Steak, Change a Tire, Impress a Girl, and 97 Other Skills You Need to Survive. Without anything further, here's my new friend and guest co-host for today's show, Jonathan Catherman from the outskirts of Charlotte, North Carolina. How's it going, man? Oh, Scott, it's a good day. How are you? Every day is a good day to be a man. Right. I'll I'll go with that. <laughs> now, listen, here's what caught my attention about your book. First of all, not only is it absolutely practical and straightforward, I mean, there's nothing fluffy at all about something called the manual to manhood that promises, well, basically a hundred skills you need as a man to survive, but it's also not a bunch of macho bullcrap. There are skills and knowledge you bring up in this book that most men, frankly, don't ever think they're going to need for a variety of reasons, either because, A, that won't happen to me, or B, hey, you know what, that's you know sissy stuff for women to do. And yet, you articulate very well why we as men really need to know these things. A couple examples straight from your Amazon uh, description of the book include how to set a table, which we think the women are going to take care of until, of course, we're you know, single and we invite a woman over for dinner and, you know, she's cultured and we end up looking like a Neanderthal, (laughs) right? (laughs) Or how to sew a button. It's like, well, my mom did that growing up. Yeah. Next time you're on a flyaway business meeting and the morning of you look down at your dress shirt and realize a button is missing from a strategic place, you won't have to panic anymore because now you know how to get that done. So the embarrassment doesn't ensue at your meeting, right? Just a couple examples from a book that really contain a lot of these different ideas, right? So is that kind of what you had in mind is preparing men how to be on the ready for just about anything, regardless of whether we're going to need to actually be prepared for it or not? You got it, man. So Scott, check this out. You said um, not really full of macho stuff, but if you don't know how to do these things, you feel the exact opposite of macho. Yeah, you feel emasculated. Right. Right. And so, And I think it's important that, and you brought it up, you know, A generation ago or two generations ago, we'd say, oh, you know, my mom used to do that stuff. Well, sewing on a button, setting a table, doesn't matter what it is. How about this? Just changing a tire. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a manly thing to do. Change a tire. You know how many guys don't know how to change a tire? Hell, most guys don't even know what the jack parts are in a car or truck. Exactly. And so it's, it's like, okay, is it about masculinity or this about being prepared to take on the demands of life no matter what comes your way? Because if you can handle it, that really makes a difference in how you view yourself as a person, how other people view you and your capabilities. If I'm confident and capable on the little things in life, I'll be confident and capable and willing to take on the bigger things in life. But if I can't do little things, then why in the world should I be trusted to do important big things? I think guys get that wrong all the time. Oh, no, no, someone else will do that. That's really not important. Really? Yeah, little, little adds up to big. Yeah, we outsource everything. And in the process of hopefully making our life less busy, we end up basically worthless and helpless <laughs> in many ways. Yeah, we're dependent. Like if we look at maturity on a, on a scale and 
low level maturity is dependence and mid level maturity is independence. And there's a higher level of maturity than that being interdependent. So dependent, you have to do it for me. Independent, I can do it for myself. Interdependent, I'm better when we do it together because you have skills and abilities that complement my skills and abilities. So high level maturity is interdependence, which means you and I know how to do this, right? But if we've got guys that can't do stuff, and, and, and I know you've got listeners right now are doing a self-inventory going, oh, how many things in life don't I know how to do? Meaning I have to outsource it to someone else. That's a level of dependence, which is low level maturity. I hate to say it. And someone's going, yeah, man, but I save time by paying someone else to do it. I got cash. That's what matters. That's the sign. No, you know what? Be at least independent and capable of doing these things on your own. It will do miracles for your confidence. Yeah, I think a lot of what you're saying harks back to that idea of there's no I in team. And a truly mature man realizes that we're all in this as a band of brothers. And we as men sometimes need to join forces, as it were, to increase our strength exponentially. And I think that's all well and good. This whole idea of outsourcing something to someone else because I either don't have the time for it or I don't know how to do it. Well, let me tell you something, and I'll let you riff on this. If you're outsourcing something that needs to be done to somebody and you have no idea at all, you have educated yourself zero about what's required there, all I have to say is watch your wallet. Because you're about to yeah. be taken. If you don't know anything yeah. about what it takes to design a website or fix a car or even how to do the landscaping in your yard, an opportunist is going to come and make sure you pay the maximum amount for the minimum amount of work done. So it always pays literally and figuratively to increase your knowledge about something, even if you don't have the wherewithal, you know, and by that, I mean, either the physical skills or the raw cycles to get it done, right? I agree. And I, we can, you know, there's a limit to this. Like I know I can't work on my new car cause I don't literally have the tech computer abilities, but I can certainly work on my older cars without any problem at all. I'm looking out the window right now. I'm sitting in my office. My son, as we're speaking is replanting our flower beds in front of the house. It's funny. You brought up the, you know, do some landscaping. I'm not having to pay someone to come in and do it. Cause my son's down there taking care of it himself. And he knows how he's, he's 18 years old, works at a nursery. He crushes our yard. Looks great. You know, how about, how about a simple one? Like let's go back to the changing the tire. I've got a friend who is the lead tool trainer for a global tool company. People fly in from all over the world and he teaches them on their new products. It's absolutely phenomenal. Okay, that's so a cooler inter- job than ours. Right? Yeah, that's a, that is a so manly cool. job. Like I am the head trainer for Snap-on Tools Incorporated. That's pretty badass. It's it's pretty remarkable. In fact, you can read about him in Manual to Manhood and the Tools and Fix-It chapter. Uh, his name is Ned and he's got a daughter. He told me about uh, a date that she went on. Really excited this boy finally asked her out comes and picks her up. They go out on the date. Um, but short while later, they're back. I mean, way too early. And dad meets his daughter. Ned meets his daughter at the door. Says, you know, what, what, what's going on? Tell me. And she goes, well, we got a flat tire. We just didn't get very far down the road and got a flat tire. And uh, he said, yeah, I mean, so why, why would that stop a date? And she goes, well, he didn't know how to change a tire. And Ned says to her, he goes, yeah, but you do. And she goes, I know. Because he had taught his daughter how to change a tire. It was one of the the, if you're going to drive, you got to know how to change a tire. And he says, well, what was the problem? Well, he wouldn't let me change the tire. So he called the service. The service shows up, you know, it took a while service shows up and, uh, and the guy's changing the tire. Meanwhile, he's flirting the whole time with the girl and the guy who had invited Ned's daughter out on the dates now totally, you know, here he's standing over there incapable of, of doing anything. The service agent shows up, is flirting with his, hopefully, you know, the date, the girl he wants to be his girlfriend. And, and they get back in the car, tires fixed, and she just looks at him and goes, I think we should call it? And the guy's like, yeah, I think we're done, you know. So he drives her home. <laughs> he, he realizes he doesn't add up two blocks from the house because he can't even change a flat tire. Well, there's a lesson learned for futures. <laughs> yeah. Guys, if you don't know how to change a tire, practice in your driveway rather than having to learn on the side of the freeway. You know, it just occurred to me, your friend who works for a tool company, if he works for Mac Tools, his title should be the Mac Daddy. 
<laughs> well, it's not Mac tools, but it's pretty cool anyway. <laughs> His shop is like, oh man, I wish I had this shop. It's absolutely remarkable. Oh, I but, can only imagine. Kind of yeah. like the Johnny on the spot fixing the tire was the Mac daddy literally in that situation and basically yep. you know, meant more to the girl. Um, you know, and this brings up another point. You talked earlier about the idea of being prepared, just increasing our self-esteem, making us feel like we're more of a man. And what that translates to is a woman feeling more comfortable in our presence, feeling safer, because it's one of those situations where a woman's thinking, okay, if anything happens, this guy's got it handled. I don't have to be the hero here. He is a man. That's what men are born to do. That's what men want to do is provide, protect, and preside like we talk about in this show constantly. And man, the more you know how to do, the more you're in a position of providing a solution, not necessarily bags of money, right? And the more you're in a position of protecting, even when the small things come up, you know, they say, don't sweat the small things. The more little stupid human tricks you know how to do, the more little silly useless skills, the more useless information you possess, the more situations you will be able to provide a solution for, and the more women will be protected, frankly, from ignorance and getting caught out without a solution. Well, we all, you know, men, women, we all want to have a sense of security, right? Yeah. And so look at it this way. Life throws demands at you every single day. You know, go through your your mind right now. Create a list of all the demands that were placed on you today, and really it boiled down to: Were you prepared to handle the demand or unprepared to handle the demand? So, if we come into a position where demand presents itself and I'm prepared, I can take on that challenge. And we love challenges. Our brains thrive in the context of challenge. We push our physical limits, our mental limits. We're willing to take on challenges because it means conquering something. In fact, we're the only species on the planet that makes up new challenges and conquers them and makes up a tougher challenge to conquer the old challenge. We're the only species that do it. There's nothing too difficult, too distant, too high, too deep, too far, too long, too slow, too old, too new. doesn't matter. If the word two is in front of it, we can handle it if we're prepared. If we're not prepared, it's not a challenge. It's a threat. And we often confuse that language, man. Are you, are you challenging me? No, the question is, well, if, if, no, I'm if you're pre- you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you're prepared, it's not a challenge or it's a challenge. If you're not prepared, it's a threat, right? Cause you say, no, I'm not challenging you. I'm threatening you because in all reality is if you're unprepared, something becomes a threat. And if you're unprepared, our brain does a different thing. It does fight or flight, right? And it could be like a big dog barking at you or some tiny spider. We know guys are afraid of both of them, right? It could be a family argument and or it could be just a prank a buddy pulls on you. Either way, your heart races and you get all sweaty. Fight or flight, you know, jumps in and you're thinking now, this is what your brain is doing. It's saying, can I survive this? You don't thrive in the context of threats. You survive demands that lead to threats. You thrive in demands that lead to challenges. And the make or break is if you're prepared or unprepared. So to all of your listeners out there, the more prepared you are, welcome to the challenges of life. You've got this, bro. If you're unprepared, well, guess what? You're going to walk around all day long feeling threatened. And I don't want to be in that position. I don't think anybody wants to be in that position. So just back this process up a little bit and figure out how you, what you need to be prepared for. You know, I'd lift it to an even higher level than that. If you're truly competent at something, it's no longer even a challenge. It's an opportunity. Yeah. Like if you yep. imagine for a second, and this is the first example that comes to mind, you're an air marshal. That is one boring ass job until it's not. And I would imagine if you've trained your entire career to be an air marshal, you know, I mean, that may be a stretch, but let's say you've trained for this particular position, you're almost looking forward to the day you're actually necessary. And you'll spring into action and you'll do what's right. I mean, you know, even if your kids are involved in a sport like mine are, and I've been involved in that sport since 1978, when I see someone new who's involved in that sport and they're struggling with something and to them, it may be a threat because they're going to feel stupid if they don't know how to get their kid's bike fixed or whatever. If someone else was newly acquainted with the sport, they've done this once or twice, it may be a challenge to help them that they're willing 
to meet. For me, I look for these opportunities to help someone feel better about being in the sport. And for me, it's no threat or challenge at all because I can do it in my sleep. And then they're usually very thankful. And you know, I'm not going around looking to give unsolicited advice or anything. I'm simply trying to help people avoid feeling uneasy or feeling like a fish out of water at something new they're doing. So I think for a guy who has true like Malcolm Gladwellian levels of competence at something, looking for these opportunities to help avert what would be a challenge or even a threat to someone else would be a big part of feeling like a man. It's a big part of feeling confident and capable. Yeah. Not gender specific at all, really. Yeah. And, well, yeah. So go back to the, the premise of, so you're totally prepared. You don't see it as a challenge. You see it as an opportunity. Same outcome, different word, because what you're looking for is a good performance on the end result. If your poor performance is in the end results, probably because you weren't totally prepared. Yeah, air marshal or firefighter. Whether you're getting home and uh, your kids are looking at you saying, what's for dinner? And you're like, oh, I don't know. You know, you say you find you're unprepared. And now you got a whole house full of angry people. Right? There, it could be high-end outcomes or something that just seems totally mundane. But if I'm unprepared, it, you might as well be rushing the cockpit in my house if you don't have dinner ready. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I mean, back in the caveman days, you know, the drive through at Whataburger wasn't an option. Your kids would starve if you weren't prepared, right? Yeah. Yeah. And this could be something for, all right, go, go to work, right? And you just have a mindset that I only get paid for what they pay me to do. Well, if you're working for me and I'm not seeing you steward your opportunities well, you're probably not going to advance in my company, right? If you're working for me and I see that you're doing everything that you're paid to do, and look at that, you're interested in raising yourself up above those who are only here to do the minimum, you're doing not just what we require, but also what will bring greater value to you and to others. You're raising your level of preparedness. I will put more challenges to you. I believe they're challenges because I think the positive outcome, the good performance on the other side is going to benefit us both. I would not put something to anybody on my team that I think is going to threaten them because I think on the outside, poor performance, and that does not help us profit. Well, you know, we've established here pretty firmly that being prepared helps you feel better about yourself. Better about one situation, better about the potential outcome of that situation. It encourages us and empowers us to be prepared, whereas when we don't feel prepared, we feel like we're kind of out on a limb. We feel vulnerable and not in the best way possible, right? And yet, I'm wondering if you agree with me on this basic premise. We're less prepared as men nowadays than we ever have been, despite the fact that most of us would readily acknowledge that we'd much rather be prepared. I mean, think of the Boy Scouts, for example. Their very motto is be prepared. And I'm in my 50s. When I was a kid, being a Boy Scout was a thing. Being an Eagle Scout was something that got you into a better university. Why? Because those kids were better prepared. <laughs> quite literally for anything. They were already leaders. They already had more knowledge. They already had more self-confidence because that's what scouting does. Meanwhile, nowadays, I don't even know any kids, my daughter or son's age who are in scouting at all. I haven't heard about the last time there was a Cub Scout meeting, even in my middle-class neighborhood. It's just not a thing anymore. And meanwhile, back in the day, I recall my grandfather having a pocket full of change and in the other pocket was a pen knife. I mean, he was ready just when he put his trousers on in the morning. Nowadays, it's like we have a smartphone and a credit card. <laughs> you know what I right. mean? It's like right. that's not quite being prepared. I remember hearing a story of Ronald Reagan when he was in the Oval Office. A little boy came in to visit the president for some reason. He was given that opportunity. And Ronald Reagan dug in his pocket and gave him a couple quarters, just like he would a grandson. And the kid never forgot that, you know, like even Ronald Reagan, the president of the United States, has a pocket full of change. What does the president of the United States need with a pocket full of change? Well, the short answer is he's prepared in case an eight-year-old little boy visits the Oval Office. That's it. That's all that was necessary to have a pocket full of change. Right. I mean, so here's the thing, and I think you're absolutely right. And let's expand on it a little bit. He might walk by a vending machine and want to pack a gum or something like that. The thing is, he had practiced that process. Time and time and time again. It was just what Ronald Reagan did, right? Right. Yeah. So think about the guys that are listening right now to our conversation and they're like, okay, I'm not prepared or yeah, I am prepared. But what does prepared mean? 
we've got to change a mindset somewhere along the lines. We got in our head, the practice makes perfect and it doesn't, it really doesn't guys. So you've got to be prepared to fail on occasion, probably more times than you succeed. If you're going to be prepared enough to succeed, because not everything goes right the first time around. I think that in our culture, we have this fear of failure. And so often we just don't even give it a go because we're afraid that we're not going to succeed. Well, if you look at anybody who's done any sport or anybody who's played any video game, or anybody who has practiced anything consistently over a long duration of time, they probably have more failures than they have success in their bucket, right? So guys, if you want to be prepared, practice repeatedly over and over and over again, things that work, do it as, and repeat it as often as you can. Figure out what doesn't work and stop doing it. Modify the process. Put yourself in a position where your outcomes are gaining in value rather than this lateral experience. It's easy to go lateral. That's just get up each day, put two feet on the floor and do this thing called life. How about living a way where you go to bed a better man than when you woke up this morning? And that takes practice. What I love about that is so many people will indeed avoid situations where they feel incompetent and instead of simply handling the core issue, which is becoming a little bit more competent at that, you know, you may be a jack of all trades and a master of none, but at least you can feel somewhat prepared for most anything that way. Instead of doing that, most people spend their life trying to find workarounds. They totally. kind of Tom Sawyer their way through life, or they look for excuses and make sure they never have to encounter a certain situation. And that brings me back around to another thing I love about your book is you have thought out of the box probably a hundred out of a hundred times. Every one of these suggestions is a unique item unto itself, which I really respect. One of them is throw darts. <laughs> and guys are thinking, well, you know, I'm not going to go to a bar and I'm not going to play darts. Well, maybe you would do more of that if you knew how to do it and you'd have more male friends as a direct result. And more importantly, man, I need both hands. When I look <laughs> back on my youthful days and recall the number of times I wish I was able to win a girl, that giant teddy bear at the fair. And the secret is know how to throw darts. Throw a dart. Yeah, that's funny. If you break the balloons with a dart, that's the easiest game at the fair. And next thing you know, your girlfriend is one of those girls walking around with a huge teddy bear. And you can walk around going, yeah, I did that. And she'll walk around going, yeah, my boyfriend did this. That is worthwhile. That's legit, man, knowing how to throw darts. And it takes a guy who's, you know, got a little life experience to even remember that that one would be important. Right. And, and so maybe we're not 14 year old years old anymore, you know, walking around the, the fair looking for ways to win our girlfriend's teddy bears, but we are looking for ways to gain respect and avoid embarrassment. Right. Anyway. So if you were to walk by the front of my house and my garage door was open, there's a dartboard in my garage and at least once a week, that door is open and there's guys in my garage. We've got music going. We're maybe wrenching on something and someone's playing darts. And the guys, and you don't have to be like a bullseye every time guy, but if you at least step up to the line, one, you know where the line is and, and, and you have some form and you hit the board, then you're good to go. In fact, in our, in our board, it's surrounded with, by wine corks. And if you don't hit the board and you hit a cork, the next guy up, if he hits a bullseye, he gets an extra throw. If he hits a bullseye on his first shot, you got to buy him that bottle of wine that you corked on the last shot. You know, so it's, it's, we have incentive in my garage to learn how to play darts, but we're also, it's not about darts. It's about being in a really cool relationship with other guys. We're in there laughing. We're talking about life, job, you know, stuff, family relationship stuff with our wives or our kids. Well, we're, it's iron sharpening iron is what it is. And if you've ever seen that experience, it's, it's loud, creates sparks and there's lots of heat produced, right? But in the end, you're a better tooled for your design instrument. And that takes place while throwing darts in my garage. So, yeah, guys, you may not be heading up to the bar, but when you do step up to a dartboard, you actually look like you know what you're doing and you're going to be in this really cool conversation with other guys who are doing the same thing. That brings up shooting pool. Mm -hmm. It brings up bowling. 
which a lot of guys think is excessively lame and perhaps is. There's even a stigma tied to being in bowling league and stuff. But all I know is if everybody goes bowling and you roll gutter balls, you're going to feel emasculated fast. Yeah. Yeah. You got to know how to throw a bowling ball down an alley. Swimming. I mean, how embarrassing is it if everybody goes swimming and you're like, ah, I think I'm going to sit this one out. Why? Because I don't know how to swim. Another one that comes to mind, driving a manual transmission. That's a big one. I watched the flood of emasculation cross a guy's face when this has to be done. And the guy's like, I, I just know how to do it. Come to one of my car shows, right? Come with us. And if you get to know one of the guys, they'll let you drive their cars. And half of them, you better know how to drive a stick. Oh, so sure. So if I say, hey, you want to take this Audi out or you want to take this Mustang out? Just to go down the road and, and let's let's go for a ride. And you're like, I, I don't know how to ride, drive a stick. I mean, you just passed on a great opportunity right there. Oh, hell yeah, you did. Go back to the bowling thing. Here's an interesting concept. Maybe life isn't all about you, buddy. Maybe someone else that you show interest in, be it a he or a she, and I don't mean romantically. These are just cool people. And they say, hey, we're going out bowling on Friday night. And you're like, ah, I don't bowl. Well, this isn't about you. This is about you spending time with other people. And if they're important to you, what they do should become important to you also. Brilliant. And, you know, a couple other things spring directly from that. I love how this conversation is going. First of all, if you don't know how to drive a car with a manual transmission, you won't know how to ride a motorcycle either. No. Nope. Forget about it. I mean. You got to know gearing. Yeah. Yeah, you got to know. Clutch it. gear. Yep. The second thing you brought up, which I think is incredibly profound and has to be expounded upon more, is it's not all about you. A guy's like, well, I have no interest in doing that. Well, what if the woman of your dreams does? What if your kids do? And probably the darkest corner of men's incompetence lies precisely in that area where women know how to do these things or women are interested in these things and men typically are not. Now, if you go out with a woman or you strike a conversation up with a woman and she says she loves to do ballet or she loves knitting and you know anything about either of those subjects just in passing, she's not going to think you're some kind of sissy. She's going to think you're amazing. Yep. Like, how could this guy possibly know that? I mean, on the outside, he looks perfectly manly. He probably showed up in a pickup truck or whatever, but he can talk to me about that, which I'm interested in, which no man has ever been able to talk to me about before. He just wanted to say, how about them cowboys when I brought up what I was passionate about? And that's huge, huge. I mean, guys come up to me and I'm sure, you know, you're talking about, you know, how to impress women and how to charm the girls in this book too, a little bit, which we could talk about. What's more charming to a woman than being able to actually make a conversation? Guys come up to me and go, well, I got nothing. Every time I talk to a woman, I have this awkward silence. Well, if you knew more about what women were interested in, perhaps you would be quicker on your feet with the conversation with them, right? And be interested in her. The number one topic yeah. is the other person. Always be interested in the other person. Dale Carnegie 101. Yeah. And you can add other things on as it goes. Like, for instance, we're coming in the holiday season, right? And um Probably in every town in America or close within driving distance of every metropolitan arena is the nutcracker. Now, if in conversation someone says, um, you know, I really look forward to going to the nutcracker every year. Last thing, guys, you want to do is cringe and act like she just kicked you in the balls. That's not the nutcracker we're talking about here. <laughs> I was going to say, okay. that's a different kind of nutcracker. Yeah. Do you mean the the ballet? I've heard that's remarkable. I've never been. Would be your statement if you've never been and maybe if you're not even interested. It doesn't. You're not saying if you're interested or not. You're just simply entering into the conversation. Let's say this is someone you're interested in. And she says, I can't wait to go this year. And you're like, oh, I really enjoy going with you. Does that sound like something we could do together? You just got yourself a date, bro. Yeah. You have to go see a ballet. And you may say, I'm not into ballet. It's not about being into ballet. It's Fair you being into something she's interested in. And because she's a woman, she'll want to reciprocate. Because you did something for her, she'll want to do something nice for you. And it might be something very nice that you'll like. Interesting. You know, you're talking about Tchaikovsky. You're talking about the Nutcracker. For guys who have never seen the Nutcracker, it's going to be a lot like seeing the Godfather for the first time. In that when you see the Godfather for the first time, you're like, oh my God, that's where that saying comes from. I've heard people say they sleep with the fishes my whole life, you know, and this is where it comes from. If you have never experienced the Nutcracker before, there were like four or five legendary melodies. 
And you'll right. go, oh, okay, I've heard this a million times, especially like around Christmas time. That's where this comes from. And all it does is it makes you wiser and a little bit more competent in, in various areas. And just like we've been talking about sort of as a sub-theme a lot lately, these are the reasons why older men get younger women. Preparedness, wisdom, a broader range of know-how. They're multidimensional. Multidimensional. They're more cultured. All these things that make women feel safe, protected, and just make a woman go, wow, who is this guy? If we could just unscrew the craniums of 25-year-old guys and pour all of this stuff in there, they would be machines with women. And that's a lot of how I coach those younger guys, by the way. But man, your area of expertise in training guys to be more prepared is so incredibly underrated by so many guys. I don't know about you, but I drive a pickup truck and I am outfitted. I got tools. I got jumper cables. I got an air dragon. I've got all sorts of things. I got a tow hook on the back and the front of my truck. I got a four by four. I'm ready to pull you out of the mud. I've got the cable line to do it. I love that about my truck. Now, that doesn't mean, like you said, that there are times of imperfection where I am lacking exactly the tool I need in a particular situation. But you know what? For the most part, 80, 90% of the time, I am Johnny on the freaking spot if somebody needs something. And I love that about my ride. Because for me, that pickup truck and everything about it is about being a man. That truck is like my hunting dog. It's actually an old truck. And I think about it exactly like I think of an old hunting dog. It's irreplaceable. Once that truck finally dies, I'll probably throw a funeral for it. But <laughs> it is just my huckleberry. That truck is prepared, and that means I'm prepared. And I've actually done videos for guys on how to prepare their rides and stuff like that. But you're taking this to a whole nother level. I'm sure your house is prepared. I'm sure your refrigerator is prepared. I'm sure your outfit is prepared. Give us more on being prepared as a man. Give me everything you got. Okay, so you, Scott, you just said you've got this pickup truck that's prepared. The pickup truck's only prepared because you prepared the truck. Oh, I don't know. It came pretty well outfitted in <laughs> Ford Motor Company. Okay, you know. Yeah, yeah, I get you there. Uh, but, I, but I feel you anyway. Yeah. We built up an old Rover. I say that by we. My sons and I got out the back of a junkyard, this Land Rover. Oh, my favorite. No, oh, man, we're, we're huge Rover fans. We built this thing up, and Defender? last weekend— we have a discovery. I want a Defender 110. That's my dream vehicle. Dude, yeah. You're not joking. No, we're we're rolling in a D2. It crushes. And yeah, it's got lights and original rack on it. And we've widened it and heightened it. And it's it's good to go. You said a minute ago, you don't know anybody who does scouts. My son does scouts. That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> right? and, uh, and so I went on a scout camp out with him and we came to a locked gate. And the distance from where the gate was to where we had planned to camp was over a mile. And we have like five vehicles and we're like, how are we going to get up there? And there's, this is a big lock. It's done. And I say, well, wait a minute, go back to the, we call it the truck, go back to the truck and uh, pulled out the toolkit and came and we just took apart the lock mechanism that held the lock in place, took the bolts off, opened the gate, drove through, closed the gate, put the mechanism back together. Gate's still locked. We're good to go. We went off to our campsites, right? So the preparedness was I didn't know we were going to need a wrench set on this camp out, but I put it in the Rover anyway. It's a mindset. I absolutely believe this and I've heard you speak to it. It's mindset, skill set, tool set. You bet. So, yeah, guys, you can load up a high lift uh, jack onto the side of your rig also. But if you don't know how to use it and you don't have the mindset to want to use it, then it's just for show. And the same thing goes for how you present yourself before your boss, before your girlfriend, before your girlfriend's parents, before your neighbor. If you don't have the mindset, the rest is just for show. Mindset, skill set, tool set. Get your head in the right place. Go practice and then pick up the tools you need to make it done when the situation demands. This goes back to our preparedness. Which may be raw knowledge, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, the tools may be knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. There's a whole tool set that just has the know-how. You know, if you know how to do something, that's its own tool right there. Also, elbow grease. You need to get yourself about two gallons of that and carry it with you everywhere you go. Now, one of the things I think that we as guys can't help but dwell on is 
this idea of being prepared, being tied to scout like stuff, like survivor skills and rubbing two sticks together and tying you know, knots, yeah, eating oh, herbs yeah. and berries and killing deer with our bare hands and stuff like that. But you know what? Anything that is a skill that's theoretically going to be necessary would count as being prepared. I mean, I think every man should know how to work with twisted pair wiring and know a little bit about telecom. We should know a little bit about electronics. We should know a little bit about how to code a computer. We should know a little bit about how to use very popular computer programs. I mean, that's different than being an expert at a video game and sitting around with Cheeto fingers, as I call it. I mean, you know, most people wouldn't think of that as preparedness per se, but being this jack of all trades, master of none really has quite literally a million and one points of value. It does. And guys tend to get a little bit provincial about where their know-how is like yeah i know all about cars you know you got this flux capacitor that's not working i'll take care of it and i can do that in my sleep but you know you ask them to boil you some pasta and they're like i have no idea i got nothing and what i love about your teaching is how multifaceted it is how well-rounded it is and i think a lot of guys can very easily miss out on that okay so here's a short list i think of things that guys need to know how to do let's hear right so so Women and dating, I'll give you a couple here. Beautiful. How to plan a date. <laughs> right? How about this one? Bet. How to meet a lady's parents for the first time. And let's say the date thing doesn't work out. How to respectfully break up with a girl. I got a whole book on it. Okay, good. And it's free, by the way. You can get it on the website, guys. Perfect. How about this one? Social skills and manners. Um, shake hands. Do you know how many grown men I know who don't know how to shake hands? Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. Dude, it's like, all right, get your fingers off my wrist, man. That's, that's, <laughs> by the way, gentlemen, the wrist is an intimate part of the body. If you shake my hand and bring your two fingers up onto my wrist, I'm like, um, either you don't know how to do this or you know what you're doing and I'm not interested. Right. You know, here's the thing about handshakes. I get so many grown men, even like these big burly guys who give me this limp wristed, like soft handshake while they're looking in the other direction. And I think the root problem there, Jonathan, might be exactly the same as the root problem of not knowing how to drive a car with a manual transmission or ride a motorcycle. You have no idea what the purpose of this is or mechanically why we're doing it. Right. And we've yep. talked about this, I believe, either on one of my programs or on this show before. The idea of a handshake is to establish that I mean you no harm. So look me in the eye. Establish mm -hmm. a connection with me. And when you shake hands with someone, that is an indication that you're firm, that you're competent, that you're a real man. And that will make me feel more confident about partnering with you, building an alliance with you. That's why handshakes are so important in international diplomacy. Because it's yep. all about building alliances. And when we treat those handshakes as a throwaway, we're treating the potential of that relationship as a throwaway. I mean, in Japan, when you trade business cards with someone, it's almost like a religious ritual. I it mean, is a ritual. With both hands and bow and, bow. and take yep. it seriously. And I think we should take handshakes a lot more seriously. Absolutely. As, as you hand someone a business card in Japan, facing them with two hands bowing is the same as if you and I were to shake hands. And I were to not just give you the limp handshake, what if I crushed your hand at the same time, reached out with my left hand and grabbed your elbow? I just messed up that handshake. It would be like laissez-faire throwing you a card if I were meeting you in Japan. I messed up the introduction. Right? You don't need to crush my hand. You don't need to be all limp either about it. You know, And, and keep your other hand off my wrist, my elbow, my shoulder, unless you and I are bros and like we're doing the handshake and I'm going in for the tap. That's cool. But this is the first one. And guys know this. If you encounter someone who the first time you meet them gives you this overpowering where they overarch their hand over yours, reach out and grab your elbow, that is a statement of dominance. Exactly. You're not going to build an alliance by alpha ink. <laughs> oh, right. The handshake was, look, I'm not holding a weapon. I'm looking at you in the eye. and You can see my expressions and we're safe in this. You really want to impress someone with your ability to alliance, sit down and eat a meal with them because that I is a, a, the most casual environment you can be in. This is why it's so powerful to invite a woman over your house and cook for her. Absolutely. You guys are thinking, oh, that's for women. Ha ha ha. Give it a try. Now you talked about guys overpowering with a handshake. Yeah. 
if you're trying to alpha someone with your handshake, you better have a good reason for doing it. Because if you're really trying to build an alliance and you're trying to crush my hand and pull my elbow and, you know, go over top. And I know people teach this. Yeah. But if you're trying to build an alliance with someone, it really is going to backfire. And I think that's incredibly good advice and a huge takeaway from the show. I really do. I think that alpha statements are kind of ridiculous sometimes anyway, because some of the most powerful people I know are the ones that you would never know are the most powerful people. Right. They don't walk around revving engines and and slapping backs and they're just confident in who they are. And from their handshake to their bank account, they're confident. They're not worried about it. They're confident. Very true. The people with the least to prove are usually the most easygoing and the ones who want to make you feel good about yourself. Yep. Those people who are truly extremely wealthy, truly famous, uh, quite successful are almost always just great people. Yep. Anytime you meet someone who has a whole lot to prove or they're trying to alpha you or show you that their car is better than yours, those are people who haven't really arrived yet. Those are people who are still struggling with their identity. I just ask why. You know why? Can I continue with the list a bit? Yeah. All right. Here's one for you. How to resign without burning a bridge. Beautiful. How to repair a rift between yourself and another man Yep. and build an alliance as a result instead of making an enemy. Yep. That's another one. You got to know how to do these things. How to invest in your future financially. I think that that's cool. I think that's probably at least a couple pages of the book. It is. Probably not a line or two. It's in there a little bit. Here's another one for you. Check this one out next time you meet a guy. Check out his fingernails. How to give yourself a manicure. Yeah. It, it doesn't have, you don't have to be all shiny, but they need not be jaggedy. You don't trim them with your teeth. Oh, man. <laughs> Women aren't going to let those fingers anywhere near their bodies. Nah, don't, don't even go there. Don't even right. go there. Right? <laughs> oh. Teeth, too. Yeah, man. Your mouth. Oh, yeah. Yep. They're not kissing that mouth. And your bed. They're not getting in that bed if it's a mess. Dude, you got to take pride in who you are. Your presentation is part of that, right? Iron your shirt. Don't to iron. You don't have to walk around with a pressed shirt all the time, but when the time is needed and you don't know how to do it, it shows. And I don't care if you live in Jimmy Buffett paradise, learn how to tie a necktie for God's sake. If you're still wearing clip-on ties at age 40, you're a loser. Or or if you look at someone's guy's closet and he's got this row of tied, already pre-tied ties. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, that his last ex-girlfriend did for him or his mommy. Yeah. That's kind of weird. Yeah. Brutal. Brutal. Yeah. Uh, you know, get some tool skills. We've already talked about that, you know, um, like circuit breaker kind of stuff, both in your car and in your house. These are little things that come up. You know, do you really know how to swing a hammer? Every guy says he does until you put a hammer in his hand. You know, I, I did this work with uh, Tommy Ford, the actor comedian uh, before he died. And we were down in Atlanta working with these guys that uh, they had been in a form of bullying that landed a couple of them in jail. And uh, Tommy Ford said to me, I want you to show these guys some levels of confidence. I said, how basic are we talking? He said, basic confidence. I said, how basic? He said, like swing a hammer basic. So I showed up at his filming. Um, he was doing a documentary with these guys with two by fours, nails and hammers. And we gave all these guys hammers and they all stood around like they knew exactly what they're doing until we gave them 16 penny nails. And then, man, it was the most ridiculous thing you'd ever seen. And half of them were trying to tap on these nails like they were doing Morse code. The other ones were swinging at it like baseball bats. And But it took about an hour. And these guys gained the confidence they needed to actually strike a nail on the head. And I'm not saying, guys, you've got to be able to go frame a house. I'm not saying that. Some of your listeners can do that. And, and they feel good. I mean, it's good to know you can can build something. But at least know how to swing a hammer so when someone asks for help on their deck, you don't look totally ridiculous. Is that a trick question? Because last time I built a deck, we used deck screws. We didn't use nails at all. <laughs> when some guy asks you to help build a shed in his backyard, you know, his, his new man land or something like that, then you don't look ridiculous. Well, in all seriousness, I don't have formal training on how to swing a hammer. You got me there. But the times I have used a hammer successfully, which are many, what I've done is I've held the nail with two fingers and started the nail so it held, then mm -hmm. rose up a couple inches and hit it a little harder till it was probably about a quarter of the way in there and then whacked it a few times just so I needed without denting the wood around the nail until it was flush. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I'd call that swinging a hammer. 
But that's how I would tactically use a hammer to get the result that I wanted. Right. I don't know if I'm right or wrong. You're 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 moving in the right direction for sure. You got some guys right now that are going like, dang man, it's like tap tap bang. Because you've got framers out there that are one and done when it comes to to driving a 16 penny nail in, right? But I'm not. Again, we're not asking you every guy to be that guy. What I do believe is important, whether it's swinging a, a hammer or knowing how to use a wrench or just knowing that there's no such thing as a left handed screwdriver, that you have some basic <laughs> tool knowledge. How to know which kind of nuts are typically left lugs. Heck, a lot of guys don't even know righty tighty, lefty loosey, right? Mm. Which is the way most nuts and bolts are. When in doubt, that's the rule. Uh, but you're right. You know, basic tool skills, basic cooking skills, basic style points, basic etiquette, basic electronics, basic computer coding, all of these things, basic health, basic first aid. We didn't even talk about that, man. How much of a man will you feel like if you save someone's freaking life? Advanced life saving, you know, in water, all of those things. The more about that, you know, the better off you are, the more confident you feel. And like we said from the outset, Jonathan, it's all about making women feel safe and comfortable in your presence. And the more you know, the more competence you have in these skills that really aren't so rare, but everyday skills that most guys still overlook the better you're going to feel about it, the more you're going to feel like a man. So I really appreciate this conversation very, very much. I mean, if you wanted a practical conversation, man, we just delivered for you. This is great. And I want to go ahead and point you to Jonathan Catherman's book, which I've added to my Amazon influencer page, and you can get on Amazon. It's called The Manual to Manhood, How to Cook the Perfect Steak, Change a Tire, Impress a Girl, and 97 Other Skills You Need to Survive. He also has great books, a whole series of books, Manual to Middle School for your younger sons, a similar book for girls written by his lovely wife, Erica, uh, co-written with him on that uh, to help girls in that situation. And you can look at the whole library of books from Jonathan Catherman when you go to the Amazon Influencer page and uh, get you some. And the price is right on these books. You can have it delivered to your door for under 10 bucks and have it as a manual that you can take right off your bookshelf. So good to have you on the show, my friend, and even better to make your acquaintance. Uh, love what you're doing. It sounds to me like you're making the world a better place. Thanks, Scott, man. It's good having these conversations, and it's good to know that, that guys are out there getting better at uh, discovering and becoming who they are and, and being confident and capable in everything they do. Yeah, and for the record, I think that's the vast majority of us as men. We all want to be a hero. We all want to be better men. Yeah, we want to be confident. We want to be capable, gain respect, avoid embarrassment, make today better than yesterday. I think that if you're in, the, in that arena, you're going to be a good man. And by the way, I did set up a URL that points to Manual to Manhood if you'd like to go directly there. And that's www.mountaintoppodcast.com front slash manual, M-A-N-U-A-L. And there you will find Jonathan Catherman's book. So guys, also, if you haven't been to mountaintoppodcast.com, now is the time to uplevel your life. Draw that line in the sand. Make today that reckoning where you say, I'm going to get this part of my life handled. I talked about that in a recent newsletter. And it's just like in Tombstone when Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday faced their adversaries and it was a reckoning. It was leading up to something. There was a point where this had to be handled or disaster was going to strike. And a lot of you guys are letting days and weeks and months turn into years and decades and you're not doing anything but what you did yesterday again today and you'll do it again tomorrow and you're surprised perhaps when your career is going nowhere when you don't have the woman in your life you want and when your life's not filled with those adventures you always dreamed of well now's the time to change that today should be the reckoning and the way to get started on that to draw that line in the sand is to get 25 minutes with me for free by going to www.mountaintoppodcast.com i'm exactly the guy you think i'm going to be uh, i'm not playing a fictional character on this podcast when we get on the phone together i think you'll be very pleasantly surprised to find that i am the real actual dude you think i am and i am ready willing and able to help you Get to the point you want to be. Just like we talked about on this podcast, you can go it alone or you can build alliances with other men for the betterment of yourself and for the world. And that's what I want to talk to you about. So go to www.mountaintoppodcast.com and 
click on that red button and get on the phone with me for 25 minutes for free. Until I talk to you again real soon, this is Scott McKay from X and Y Communications in San Antonio, Texas. Be good out there. The Mountaintop Podcast is produced by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to visit www.mountaintoppodcast.com for show notes. And while you're there, sign up for the free X and Y Communications newsletter for men. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for the Mountaintop Podcast.